Superhero movies are a staple of modern cinema, but their road to mainstream popularity wasn't always smooth. For decades, most attempts to bring comics to life have either flopped or were met with total indifference. Here are a few superhero movies that you've probably never seen. If you're not familiar with the superheroes of Valiant Comics, all you really need to know is that they mostly create characters by mashing other iconic characters together. Exo Man of War, for instance, is essentially Conan the Barbarian with a suit of Iron Man armor. Bloodshot is Arnie from Predator mixed with Arnie from The Terminator. And Ninjax is pretty much a crossover of Batman and James Bond, which is exactly as awesome as it sounds. In 2018, Valiant decided to try bringing their characters to the big screen. Originally released as a web series a few years earlier, Ninjak vs. the Valiant Universe did exactly what it says on the tin, pitting super spy ninja Colin King against the live-action version of his entire comic book universe. Unlike most obscure comic book movies, however, this one's actually worth watching, if only for the cast. Pro wrestler John Hennigan plays the Eternal Warrior, while Bloodshot is played by former Power Ranger Jason David Frank. The debate over which Swamp Monster is better has been raging ever since DC's Swamp Thing and Marvel's Man Thing first debuted, within three months of each other way back in 1971. When it comes to their adventures outside of comics, though, there's no question about who got the better end of the deal. Swamp Thing is starred in a live-action TV series, a cartoon for kids, two movies, and a streaming series that, while short-lived, was extremely well-received. Man-Thing, however, had a movie that made 3% of its budget in its international theatrical release and went straight to cable in America. It's also primarily remembered for featuring a cast of Australian actors attempting to perform Louisiana accents to varying degrees of success. What? No offense, but well, I just expected someone more, more experienced. The movie does have a few good points, though. Man-Thing himself has a pretty cool design, especially when your expectations are adjusted for a low-budget sci-fi original from 15 years ago. Unfortunately, all of the weirdness that makes Man-Thing so interesting in the comics are ditched in favor of a fairly generic slasher, where Man-Thing is ostensibly portrayed as the bad guy. There have actually been two movies based on the spirit, Will Eisner's groundbreaking Golden Age comic strip. The first was a 1987 TV movie starring Sam J. Jones, whose previous comic strip adaptation Flash Gordon became a cult classic thanks largely to its lavish campiness and killer soundtrack by Queen. The Spirit was meant as a pilot of a TV series, but it failed to get the ratings that were needed to convince anyone that a full series would be a good idea. The 2008 Spirit film, on the other hand, failed at literally everything. It was written and directed by Frank Miller and starred Gabriel Macht in the title role opposite Samuel L. Jackson as his arch nemesis, the octopus. If Miller's name sounds familiar, that's because he's the groundbreaking creator responsible for The Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One, two of the most highly regarded Batman comics of all time. Miller approached the spirit the same way that he and Robert Rodriguez had approached their movie adaptation of Miller's own over-the-top noir comic Sin City right down to the high-contrast visuals, ridiculous dialogue, and goofy comedy violence. The problem, or one of them at least, was that the only thing Eisner's style and Miller's style had in common was that they were both technically comic books. The end result was a film that is arguably the single worst comic book adaptation of all time. Yes, even worse than whichever one you're currently thinking of. It makes Corman's Fantastic Four look like Captain America's Civil War, and makes Batman and Robin look like Batman. Unsurprisingly, the spirit tanked at the box office. It's probably not a coincidence that Macht hasn't done much movie work since. No comics franchise embodies the 90s quite as much as the X-Men. At the height of the decade, there were about 17 X-related comics hitting the shelves every month, and the one that best captured the spirit of the era was probably Generation X. As the name implies, it was focused on a group of younger mutants, led by established fan favorite Jubilee, who formed the new class of disaffected teenagers at Xavier's school. Based on that description, it probably seems like the perfect franchise to adapt into a movie. In fact, the producers hoped it would serve as a pilot for an eventual TV show. It probably would have, too, if the Generation X movie had happened under literally any other circumstances. Sadly, pretty much everything was stacked against it. For one thing, its release coincided with the collapse of the comics industry, and while the Generation X comics were genuinely good and had hordes of dedicated fans, it just wasn't the time to be launching a TV series. Even if it had lured in the comics audience, though, there were choices made that seemed designed to alienate fans, such as casting a white actress to play Jubilee, one of Marvel's most prominent Asian-American characters. Also, instead of using an established supervillain, former Max Headroom actor Matt Brewer played a generic weirdo mad scientist. Of course, it didn't help that it was also just generally awful. 
In addition to looking like it was filmed entirely in a laser tag arena, the effects were terrible even by the standards of a 1996 TV movie. And as for the performances... But everything I said I could do, I've done. And now you're a chiching millionaire. Here's hoping that Gen X's predecessor New Mutants has better luck when its movie adaptation comes out, assuming it ever does. Hey, wait a second. Justice League isn't an obscure movie at all. It was a worldwide hit that made over $650 million at the box office, led by a cast of household names sitting at the heart of a massive shared universe. Except, of course, this isn't that one. No, this is Justice League of America, the unaired in America 1997 TV pilot that nobody saw and even fewer people liked. It's hard to understand why, though. After all, it's the Justice League. It even features everyone's favorite DC characters, such as Guy Gardner, Ice, and the Martian Manhunter. Yeah, so rather than using the classic lineup of characters like Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, this Justice League was based on the late 80s Justice League International comics, where the team was reimagined as something more like a sitcom fronted by a roster of third stringers. And honestly, that's not a bad idea. JLI was the source of some of the best DC comics of its era, and the lower-stakes adventures of characters like Blue Beetle and Booster Gold were undoubtedly far easier to produce on a TV budget. Even the setup for the show seems like it's ahead of its time, intercutting the same kind of first-person interview segments with the comedy, the same way that The Office and Parks and Rec would years later. Of course, that setup only really works if the writing is any good. The writing in Justice League of America was not. Believe it or not, the Marvel Cinematic Universe wasn't the first time that two of Marvel's most famous heroes got together for a live-action adventure. Instead, that honor goes to The Incredible Hulk Returns, a 1988 TV movie in which The Incredible Hulk returns. Okay, not the best title in the world, but hey, you can't win them all. Released in 1988 as a continuation of The Incredible Hulk TV show, this TV movie was supposed to be just like a classic comic book team-up between the Hulk and the God of Thunder. But Thor Ragnarok this ain't. If nothing else, it has exactly the level of special effects that you'd expect from a show where the main technical achievement was finding a large man, giving him a pair of jorts, and painting him green. Like the comics, Thor has been cast out of Asgard and mystically bonded with Don Blake. But in this version, Blake doesn't turn back into Thor. Here, he just sort of stands around providing play-by-play -play commentary while Thor hits things. Presumably because someone wanted Thor and Blake to interact with each other and forge a buddy comedy dynamic that they could use to sell a Thor TV show. It never happened. If The Incredible Hulk Returns had a title that was a little too literal, its sequel had one that was an outright lie. Not only did Trial of The Incredible Hulk not feature the Hulk being put on trial, it didn't feature any trial at all. There is a single courtroom scene when Bruce Banner flips out and turns into his alter ego, a scene featuring Stan Lee in his first Marvel cameo, no less. But even that happens in a dream sequence. What it does have, in keeping with its legal themes, is a team-up with blind lawyer and part-time super ninja vigilante Matt Murdock that was meant to be a backdoor pilot for a Daredevil series. While that never happened, there actually is some fun Daredevil stuff in here, including the casting of John Reese davies as the Kingpin. And yes, like the 2015 Daredevil series, this one features a hallway fight. It's not quite as brutal, though. If you ever find yourself wondering how hot comics were in the early 90s, consider this. Back then, live-action superhero movies were produced in order to promote comics rather than the other way around. Well, one was, anyway. 1993's Firearm, released exclusively on a VHS tape that came with the number zero issue of the comic of the same name. Okay, so movie might be pushing it. This thing clocks in at just over half an hour if you count the supplementary two-minute promo for the rest of the Ultraverse comics. While the movie is of the quality you'd expect for a low-budget VHS short film, the comic itself wasn't bad for its abbreviated run. Both the film and the comic were written by James Robinson, who would go on to write the comic Starman, which is finally remembered as a true classic of its era, and the movie adaptation of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which definitely isn't. Take a moment and imagine the Nick Fury of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He's the cool, no-nonsense super spy who stepped out of the shadows in 2008 to reveal that there was more to Iron Man's world than just Tony Stark. He's the stern commander who brought the team together in the Avengers. He's the tough-as-nails badass who made a shocking return from the dead in Captain America the Winter Soldier. Now imagine that instead of Samuel L. Jackson, that same character was played by David Hasselhoff. Oh, no. Well done. But it happened, believe it or not, in 1998 as part of another ill-fated attempt to make a TV movie based on a Marvel character, who admittedly originally kind of looked like Hasselhoff anyway, in the hopes of eventually launching a series. Shockingly, it didn't work. 
although the movie is at least a little watchable for its sheer absurdity. MCU fans will undoubtedly know Stan Lee is the friendly face of the Marvel Universe. He's the guy who co-created Spider-Man, the X-Men, and the Avengers, and left behind a towering legacy in pop culture. And no doubt, all of that is true. Stan the Man's later career, however, was a little rockier. In the 2000s, he tended to attach his name to basically any project he could, regardless of how involved he had been with them. Case in point, 2006's Lightspeed, which features a character who can be generously filed under the heading of Stan's lesser creations. The premise is an architectural marvel constructed entirely from cliches. A guy named Daniel Light gets speed powers, becomes a costumed hero, and fights a big python man named Python. It's not even interesting in its terribleness, except for the hilarity of the difference in how Lightspeed looks on his straight-to-video box art and the way he looks in the actual movie. Talk about liberties. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.